sending my children to school, I prioritize making enough money to eat, I prioritize you know, certain things. So what I've noticed is that if you can get them to be productive on the things that they know how to do, because the truth of the matter is that they're lacking productivity in what they know. We're lacking productivity in terms of our land use. Many people say we want to clear land for farming, clear land. what are you doing on the farming land that you have already? What is the yield on the farmland that you have already? If you've not maximized that productivity, then you're no, th there's no point in clearing more land and destroying the, the ecosystem. So how do we get people to be efficient in what they're doing now and using that opportunity, that um, newfound um, uh, profits and revenue structures to be able to then include other things? And you see systems where they add financial um, tools to people in rural settings, agency banking, then you see systems where people also say, you start with USSD. If you start with USSD, you can slowly ease somebody up to using a smartphone. Mm. But at the same time, I can't give somebody a smartphone when Glow or MTN or any of those other companies have not reached their village because what data are they going to be using? So I think that it's a dual approach where there has to be a foot in the door technique where you get them comfortable give them the amenities in their area, whether it's government or whether it's private sector or whether it's they themselves. When they are happy and content in the place where they are and there's infrastructure where they are, their children are not gonna run to the urban settings. And so then you'll start to see that younger generation embracing technology, embracing and being included in everything. Excellent, and I like the fact that you mentioned um, the opportunities were given through um, USSD, so low-skilled, again, fast technologies that enable, for example, mobile money, uh, where people are given uh, not just uh, cash transfers, but also things like insurance through simple USSD codes. Kola, do you agree that that's working? We have just one minute to round up, so. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, not to take from what she said, I think absolutely agree. It's all about use cases. People mm. don't want to use technologies just for the sake of using technology. They want mm. to use technology to make their life better, to increase their income, to, um, you know, to solve problems. And so uh, the best way to get uh, the, the folks in the rural on board is to really figure out how we can help solve their problems, increase their mileage, and make their lives better. And, and I think we're starting to see that in financial inclusion, where folks assume that just because you need a BBN to do this, then folks will go and open an account by all means. But, but what you're finding with models like um, Farm Crowley and Thrive Agric is that they're able to include people within the financial system because it, it now becomes a tool to access credits or, or, or what have you. So as you, as you build your business model, think about use cases. Think about, uh, there's a concept I like called the jobs to be done. People tend to hire technology or goods and services to actually perform certain jobs. And so if you think about it in that context, you're better able to match uh, folks with the technology that they need. And in 10 seconds, final words? I, I think I can't add any uh, more that you, you, you have just said, so I would rather enjoy the silence of 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, so thank you very much to Thomas, Kola, and Angel. It's been a very enlightening session. Thank you. Um, so we'll take a picture. I hope that was interesting. <laughs> Tea break again, really? You really don't like your health. But I, li I like you, so I'm going to save you that ignominy. Uh, I need you to do me a favor. If you enjoyed this session, can you repay our, our work? Not, again, don't be too in a hurry to clap, because I'm, I'm going to take a bit more than clapping from you. Um, we need to fill up this seat in front. That's the favor I need you to do for me. Since you already showed your willingness by starting to clap, it shows that you're willing to do us the favor. Could we have some people behind help us and come forward? 
I'm going to tell you the truth, the reason why. It's for the aesthetics. It's for the aesthetics. We want to be able to see full seats when we beam out what we're doing here. Please help us. I won't say help us to help you because I absolutely see no, I don't see how it's going to help you, but just help us. If you could, please, there's still more seats to fill. So if you think the other person is going to fill it, let me tell you it won't, it's not going to happen. So if you're thinking someone else will fill the seats, then just be the someone else. There's, you can sit anywhere. To be honest, forget the reserved on the chairs. Just come, remove it. Anyone that fights you, tell me. I'll fight for you. Guys, is this fine? The people that gave me the work, is this fine for them to leave the first couple seats? I don't think it's necessary, to be honest. Can come and sit on it. There's no special seat. Thank you. So our next activity is uh, a pop-up session. We're going to be learning something about uh, building an, an outsourcing company in Africa and what works, but from the angle of fashion, interestingly. We're going to learn quite a bit. And our resource person is Ogwa Iweze. Ogwa Iweze. She's ready? Please give her a round of applause. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ogwa Iweze. I am the creative director of a brand called Design. Design is a women's wear brand. And we have been in business for 13 years now. Design started as a hobby and a passion um, for clothes. The idea was to make clothes for people, plain and simple. But um, as I've grown over the years and I've seen how, you know, building from your passion and understanding that this is what you want to do in life and being able to monetize it. I started to look into ready to wear. When I started ready to wear, it was pretty early in the industry and a lot of people were not doing ready to wear. So it was, it was a big risk because you have to commit a lot of resources and funds to, um, you know, making clothes and then expecting that people are going to come and buy the clothes. And if people don't buy the clothes, your money is just tied up in stock. So for me, one of the first things I learned was being able to f see into the future. You can't see into the future, yes, but being able to say, I believe that if I create this dress, people are going to like it and buy it. And I think that translates to everything in business and entrepreneurship because Whatever it is you believe people want is what you put out and you think that someone is going to come and buy it. Now, the more you believe in the product, I believe the more people, you can convince people to buy it. Okay, um, to cut the long story short, because I was told I have 10 minutes, I, um, I've been on that journey for a long time. And for me, one of the most convincing things was at first, it was that it wouldn't work in Nigeria because, oh, people, do people buy clothes in Nigeria? They always travel abroad to buy clothes. And then the second thing was that, oh, people don't like to wear what everyone is wearing. But I, and, and one thing I learned from that was that um, a lot of times when you go into business or you want to start something, there's always that notion. There's always these um, myths that people come up with. You can't do this. You have to do it this way. It has to be like this. And at the end of the day, I'm convinced that half of those things are only true if you want them to be true, if you believe that that's how it should be. So for example, if someone said to me then, ready to wear won't work, nobody will buy it. You, can't, you have to wait for people to come and order, wait for them to bring their fabric before you can produce. 
But I, I mean, I saw beyond that, and I thought, no, but people should be able to walk in and buy something, especially when they don't have time. And today, I can say I've sold some pieces. I've sold 700 or 800 or 1,000 of them. And this is now going from, starting from saying you sell one, you sell two, you sell three, and then you keep on going like that. So one thing I would say to anyone here who is an entrepreneur is, you, you start something because you believe in it. Most times, it's, a, it's something that is in you. You have a passion. You, you can't sleep at night. And it's, you know, the idea keeps growing. And you keep writing things down. And you keep saying, I can do this. And then once you share it with one person, there's that negative. First thing is, are you sure? Are you sure this thing will work? I will tell you a story. The lady that, um, there's a product called Spanx. And I read her story. And for her, one of the things she said was, when you have an idea, make sure you finish developing it before you tell anyone. And basically, Spanx is something you wear. It's like a garment that helps to slim um, your waistline. So people, like an undergarment. So women, it's something for women, you know, you want to hide your folds or, you know, things like that to smooth your, your skin before you wear a dress. So when she thought about doing Spanx, she said this is what she did. She just developed the product, did all the sampling. She didn't tell anyone. And then the first day, she, went, she called her mom and her aunt and a few people, and she just said to them, try this on. And they went in, they tried it on, wore their dresses, and they were like, wow. But she said if she had told one or two of them beforehand, they would have said to her, are you sure? I don't think people will buy this thing. Are you sure? Would it work? Is it, is it practical? You know all those things that people tell you that make you now start to doubt yourself. And then half of the time, you kill the dream. Dream. You may not kill the dream, but the negativity is so much that you don't go ahead with it. Meanwhile, it may have been a million dollar product. Because today, Spanx is worth billions of dollars. And for me, learning from that, all I can say to everyone here is, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you can do something, and it may not necessarily be closed, it can be even like um, any ideas that you have, you seriously have to develop that idea before you start to doubt yourself. Like, you, there would always be problems, there will be challenges, but the idea can work, especially if you believe in it. And I believe that most times, it's you, uh, the more you believe in something, the easier it is to sell it. So say this dress I'm wearing, this dress is by another Nigerian designer, by the way, called Belois, because I'm a strong believer in the Nigerian brand and dream, and I support Nigerian brands to the core. And even this bag I'm carrying is also by a Nigerian brand as well, made here in Nigeria. So for me, I'm so proud to talk about how I've seen people develop products based here in Nigeria. For my business, I got into the point where I have this big retail dream, and I want to, st to stand on stage and talk about doing 100,000 pieces, 200,000 pieces in retail. And it sounds crazy, but the truth is it can be done. Um, this year, I found a company in Enugu that produces garments. And for me, I've been so amazed because I've gone to China, India, um, Istanbul. I've gone all over the place finding, trying to find um, manufacturers who can produce my clothes for me. Not that I don't have my small production units, but because of the dreams I have, I have to look for big manufacturing companies that can produce a thousand pieces, two thousand pieces in a short time. So I still manage my small production units, but I'm, you know, thinking ahead and trying to find bigger factories. So I've gone to all these places. I've sampled everywhere. And you know, there's been one glitch or the other. Sometimes they produce, it's not the right, you know, style or the size or something. And this year, I stumbled across a company in Enugu here in Nigeria. And the most unlikely, on Instagram, you know, someone just sent me their link. I looked at it, I was like, well, it just looks interesting. Let me contact them. I contacted them. I sent them samples, and they produced the samples. I think I produced my first batch, which we just produced, we did about 500 pieces. We've sold about 300 of them already. And I like to talk, you know, based on facts. And when I get invited to talk, I want to be able to tell people the truth. 
that it's not easy. It's not like, you know, it's, you know, I mean, it's not like I just, you know, produced. Of course, it took time, change this, do this. But at the end of the day, the things came and the reception has been amazing. Let's not even talk about the pricing. I haven't found a cheaper factory than Enugu, even in China. And China is supposed to be cheap. But you know, by the time you produce in China and ship it down and everything, imagine the cost. I've even found another factory in Lagos. And the beauty is that now, because of how business works, if you wanted to design clothes, you don't even have to own one machine. You don't have to start looking for tailors. Because I get asked a lot, how do you find tailors? How do you do? And I'm like, at this point in, in, in fa the fashion business, we have to start thinking beyond owning one machine and one tailor. It's gone beyond that. It's really gone beyond that. So I'm, you know, like for me, I stand here saying the Nigerian dream is real and it can work. Because this factory in Enugu is expanding every day. They're employing new people because they're getting more orders. More people are finding them. More people are producing with them. And it will get to a point where nobody is traveling to any other country because we can do it here. We can do everything here. We just have to believe in it and believe enough. So I think I'll stop here. And um, I don't know what I next I'm supposed to. That's it. Thank you very much. So that's why she's still seated here. So yes, please, let's give a round of applause. As she Steps out. Thank you. Uh, we're not done. We're moving straight into another activity, right? It will soon be lunch time, very soon. But before, but before we go to eat, let's have another conversation. And this one, considering the climate that we are currently in, is perhaps one of the more important ones we are going to have during the entire conference, not just today. I'm pretty sure we saw the BBC documentary. We've seen the, the entire Me Too movement. We've seen so many movements around women's bodies and the agency that they have and they own. So it is very apt that in this particular conference, which deals with well, us leveraging on uh, our potentials that people keep talking about, well, how about we also identify some of these challenges that might be preventing us from leveraging on our potentials and try to understand what people are doing and what we can do even more around them. So a very important conversation that we are going to have today, which I'm actually looking forward to very much, is on sexual and reproductive health and rights, right? As well as gender-based violence. I'm pretty sure the numbers, if which they will be giving us, the numbers are not very pretty to read, they're not very pretty to listen to either, but it will be great for us to understand the mentality and idea around it. We'll be listening to a number of people who are working in the space, who are actually doing some work beyond the commentary that we see and have on social media, which is in many cases just as important because if you don't identify that you have a problem, you're never going to start solving that particular problem. Are we ready? Okay, so I'll just uh, call out the members of the panel. So there's a there's one male here. Okay, I met one of the panel members yesterday and I had a conversation with her. She's a student. She's possibly one of the people I'm looking forward to listening to a lot. The energy and the verve that she came to Abuja with, I think we're all going to benefit from it a lot. I'd like to introduce um, the moderator, Kewe Ogide. Please, let's, if you don't clap, they won't come out. When you clap now, they will hear. Kewe, yes. Yes, Kewe has come out. Uh, the other panelists are Kunle Kakanfo. Ayodeji Osowobi, I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure I murdered that name, as well as Adora Chinedu. Please, just, they may not hear. Yeah. Yes, yes, you can come in. Your panel, ma'am.
Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Welcome to the health session of the DEC conference. My name is Kevin Ohide. I'm the communications lead at Connected Development, and we empower marginalized communities. I never pass on the opportunity to sell code. Forgive me. Yeah, so we have a tremendous panel, um, panel session. This is how the session will play out. I'll just throw, give a bit of a background so everyone has a context, and then the panelists go. Afterwards, we'll open up for everyone to give, to ask a question. So if you have something on your mind, please just save it up, then we'll talk about it afterwards. Now, we're looking at um, improving SRHR and gender-based violence, and it's more focused on the yin and yang of a healthy society, right? So I'm going to ask Kunle to talk about what the implications of a healthy society is in the context of Nigeria. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, it's um, a healthy society. It's um, a society that that um, enjoys that state of um, well-being, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always a difference between the individual enjoying the state of well-being and well-being emotionally, physically, mentally, and um, a society. So the, my own work, um, rather than sit um, in the clinic as a doctor, um, I rather look at communities and society. So the healthy society, most of the time, is a society that also have um, the optimal um, index when it comes to health. Um, and um, basically, most of this index are, are what we all know, and um, like um, the infant mortality rate, the, the maternal mortality rate, and, and all that. And basically, in context, uh, in the context of sexual um, health and um, reproductive and rights, mm -hmm. um, the healthy society is the one where um, you have you know, laws that can govern um, the ability of people to be able to um, have those rights, sexual and reproductive rights. Yeah. And um, a healthy society is not just the one that have laws, uh, the ones that allow also people in the society to be able to live up those rights in terms of being able to um, choose um, their reproduction, for example, or for example, be able to plan their reproduction. Um, and a healthy society in the context of sexual um, um, health is also one that uh, gives the enabling environment for um, everyone to be able to hold up onto their sexual rights. Yeah. So uh, basically, um, in the context which we talk, and talk context which a lot of young people um, are mostly affected, um, a healthy society is a society where um, if you need to assess um, sexual health, um, you know where to go to. Um, a healthy society is the one that provides information um, about sexual health. Um, you know who to talk to, you know where to go to. Um, if you're involved in any um, issues around sexual health or your reproductive health or your rights, as it were, um, you know how to redress it. And a healthy society is the one who, who puts those um, individuals um, um, in the center of, of how the care is designed. So but, but basically, for us in Nigeria as a country, um, we were still in the primitive phases of being able to say that we have um, rich um, healthiness in terms of sexual and reproductive health. Um, there's a whole lot that still needs to be done. Yeah, uh, sure. While before we came in, you were talking about um, the life expectancy, for example, and, and those are indexes that um, is being looked at. Um, life expectancy in Nigeria um, is less than 50 years. And um, there are also other indexes around um, cases of um, sexual and reproductive health and, and rights uh, that for, for Nigeria, we still have um, the WHO had recently uh, declared that there's a pandemic around um, the issues of sexual health and um, or, or gender-based violence as well. So a healthy society is a society where everyone understands, um, both the individuals, um, the government, the civil society organizations, understand this right, understand um, access to care around sexual and reproductive health, and know how to assess this care, and know how to get the right information and all that. I'm sure as we go on, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it. Thank you, Kunle. Um, before, just before I ask, I did you to tell us a bit about sexual reproductive health and rights. United Nations Development Program describes um, early marriage as a form of gender-based violence. Is that something you want to talk to us about, please? Thank you very much. Um, 
I want to talk about early marriage in terms of child marriage mm -hmm. for people below the age of 18. Um, and people don't understand what child marriage actually, how it contributes to gender-based violence. So anyone that is 17 or below that age bracket cannot really make a decision, an informed decision um, about their lives if they don't have education, if they are not um, having access to reproductive um, information like he rightly mentioned. Um, so it is a form of gender-based violence because a person below the age of 18 cannot give consent for any sexual relation relationship. And if you notice, children who are first into uh, um, child marriage actually sometimes have to leave school and they cannot mm -hmm. make informed decisions about um, their lives. They are children, they get pregnant, give birth to children. And if you look at the statistics right now, out of every 100,000 births, 576 maternal mortality happens. And most of that age bracket is between 10 and 19. And the majority fall on their children who are below the age of 18. So you have children giving birth to children and dying in the process. And that's a form of gender-based violence because you're limiting someone else's rights by forcing them into a relationship. It's a, I don't even like to call it child marriage. I like to call it child rape because it's, it's rape. A child cannot consent to sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. It's rape. And most of the children who get married are susceptible to intimate partner violence. They can't make informed decisions about facing their children because they are kids. And there's a lot of family pressure on them 